Northampton Historical Commission. Pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued March 12th, 2020, this meeting will be held using remote participation and it is being recorded. Um, we always begin the meeting with general public comment. And if there is anyone who has anything they would like to bring up that is not an item already listed on the agenda for later discussion, uh, please do so at this time. And I don't see any hands. I have a trivial question. I thought that the meetings of this group were to be on Wednesdays. Are they normally Mondays now? They've okay. always been on Mondays, Jonathan. Okay. Um, okay. Monday at 5.30, the fourth, uh, fourth Monday of the month. Okay. Yep. I've just been listening to my dreams or something here. Yeah. <laughs> is that a problem for you? That, is no, that a conflict no. for you? No, fine. Okay, great. All right. Um, we next will approve minutes. I don't believe we have any to approve. So um, I'm going to move to on and do a short chair's report to bring everybody up to date on some of the happenings since we last met. Um, first of all, as you all know, I, I um, represent this commission on the Community Preservation Committee and we had a second round of funding um, that was just um, completed uh, in March, maybe early April. And we, um, the committee awarded or recommended for award three historic preservation projects. Um, one is 70,000 for a citywide preservation plan. And we as a commission uh, will be involved in that. Um, second is a $21,000 grant to historic Northampton to replace the balustrade on the Damon house. So that's the first of the three houses that historic Northampton owns. And also to do a conditions assessment for the shepherd barn. So pretty exciting. And then the third is a $14,000 a grant to the Lilly Library to uh, do work on their granite steps, which are falling apart. So don't even think about using them if you, um, if you, you know, had the temptation. Okay, so that's that. Those awards will be going before the city council sometime soon and um, those projects will be underway. Uh, second of all, um, many of you may have read in the newspaper, there's an article, uh, uh, excuse me, an exhibit that is going on up in Florence. It's called She Shapes History. And this is a, a, a set of panels that were lent to um, the League of Women Voters and Partners in Northampton um, by the Berkshire Museum. And they're celebrating women who voted for equality and voting rights and they're in seven, seven storefronts in Florence. So if you have a chance to get up and take a look at those, the exhibit is up uh, through May 1st. Thirdly, uh, the Bridge Street Cemetery, I don't know if any of you have been by there. I know Dylan, you live right near there. Maybe some of the others do too. Um, the work on the new fence is just about completed, fencing and gates. And also six stones in the oldest section were crushed by a uh, pine that was blown over in one of those big windstorms that we had recently. Uh, and the DPW is working on getting those conserved. Um, the State Hospital Memorial Park, you know, some of the, the new commissioners are probably not familiar with this. This is a project that's been going on for a very long time. Um, Barbara and I have been involved in it, Barbara the longest. Um, this is a small parcel of land that was um, reserved when the transfer of that property uh, went out of the state and into development uh, after the state hospital was virtually demolished and it was reserved as a memorial park and the park is almost complete. Um, there is a dedication that is scheduled for Saturday, June 5th, Sunday rain date beginning at 1. Um, so things that need to continue uh, to be done there, um, there's a planting plan that was done that uh, will include planting the rest of the park. Um, there's some interpretive panels that are going to be placed that have been ordered, and then there'll be a commemorative um, 
marker that's also going to be placed. So it's pretty exciting to see that coming together after so many years. I don't know, Barbara, you can here, just here, here. <laughs> You've been at it a lot 20 longer. years, 20 years probably. Wait, yeah, wait, we started in 1996 or 19, no, no, 2006 and seven, listening to really doing planning, but it's been longer than that. Yeah, well, it's a heroic effort on your part, and Joe, your husband, and also Tom Riddell, who's been involved in it as well. So uh, thanks to all of them. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to remind uh, everybody um, and also members of the public, uh, if you're listening in, um, the members of the public are not permitted uh, per the state open leading law to contact commissioners and have private conversations outside the meeting setting. Um, any um, issues that they want to discuss need to be brought to the meeting forum and we will discuss them as a commission. And that also goes for historical commission members meeting separately with members of the community um, or with each other outside the meeting setting. It's just not permitted by state law. I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Okay, that's the report. So we have a public hearing. Um, this is a local historic district certificate of appropriateness that is being presented um, by Smith College, we should say the trustees of Smith College. Um, it's pursuant to section 195 of the Northampton Code for the for proposed roof, door, and window replacement and modification and roof heating, ventilation, air conditioning work is part of a, a major building renovation. And this is at the alumni house at Smith. Um, and it looks like, um, is it Gary Hartwell who will be yes. presenting for the college? I'm hoping. Well, I'm gonna introduce our architects. Okay, great. So uh, we're working with KPMB from Toronto, Canada. Um, so Chris Kaus is the principal and David Poloway is the, I say, managing architect. And um, they've been working on this project for over four years and we finally have a project. So here we are. Fantastic. Um, before you go, um, I wanted to just um, tell the commissioners, remind the commissioners, and, and we also have new, some new members. So this sounds a little redundant. I just want to make sure everyone is on the same page about this. The purpose of this is um, because Smith is, parts of Smith are within the local historic district, um, they need to be issued a certificate of appropriateness uh, per the standards of the district to go ahead with the work that they're doing. Um, what we're doing tonight is trying to decide whether we want to issue that certificate of appropriateness. appropriateness. Um, we have to agree that all portion, all our portions of the work will meet the standards um, and is appropriate for the character of the district. And so um, there are alternatives if that does not get is that that's not something that we are comfortable doing, but I just wanted to uh, bring everybody up to date on that. And um, we have a design standards handbook, which I'm sure all of you have seen and know here that spells out how we review uh, and the standards to which we review changes within the district. That said, I'm happy to um, hand this over to Mr. Kaus and Mr. Poloway. Hope I'm saying that right. Thank, thank you, Martha. Uh, I'm going to share a screen, if I may. Please do. Uh, I think you have to allow me to. Oh, I pro uh, let me see. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, you should be all set. Thank you. So we should be seeing a uh, screen that says Smith College on it. Can everybody yes, see that? It's visible, yep. Great, okay, I'm gonna to go to full screen just so you can see that for the moment. So um, you're seeing a view of uh, Smith College um, alumni house in the background here. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, it's a building that dates from 1938. And I'll talk about the history a little bit in a moment. I just wanted to speak a little bit about who we are, I'm sure, very few of you, if any of you have heard of KPMB. Um, we're a Canadian firm, we're based in Toronto, and um, 
we have done a lot of work in the US. A um, couple of projects I'll just show you. Uh, on the left is uh, the Adams Center for Musical Art, um, Musical Arts that started out as Henry Hall. That's a, a Yale University uh, view from Elm Street. So this is from the parks across the street. So very prominent building that's uh, at the heart of the Yale campus between the cross campus and uh, Elm Street. And uh, David and I completed that uh, about five years ago, four years ago. Now, um, previous to that, in 2003, we did another renovation to uh, Sprague Memorial Hall, which is around the corner on College Street and also in the heart of the Yale campus. It's um, both projects were for the School of Music. Um, that's what they have in common. So Sprague Hall is their recital hall location. Um, project we finished a few years ago at Robertson, uh, renovation of Robertson Hall at Princeton University. And on the right, a Toronto project, the Royal Conservatory of Music, um, which was a major restoration of an existing um, conservatory building and additions. So, and actually the view behind me is uh, historic Massey Hall, which is uh, Canada's answer to Carnegie Hall, I guess you might say in 18, 78 building um, that's currently undergoing uh, renovations and restorations. So our work is often new, but uh, much of it uh, involves heritage buildings and renovations and restorations to them. Uh, so just um, a quick look, because I thought this might be interesting. Um, one of the, the blueprint construction drawings from Evans Moore and uh, Woodbridge's set, uh, Frederick J. Woodbridge was the designer of this um, building. And it's, um, we really fell in love with this building when we started working with it because it is a building of uh, some really considerable architectural ambition, um, but very it's sort of modest in certain ways. It doesn't have um, huge presence and kind of heroic elements, but it's a very, very skillful blending of uh, colonial uh, Greek Revival, Art Deco styles. Um, it's, you know, if you've never been inside it, there are some really remarkable interiors um, that go along with the exterior. But I think what, what impressed us most was the, um, the highly skillful handling of the various uh, genres altogether that uh, kind of blend very smoothly and consistently within this building. So we have a, a huge degree of respect for the building as it was originally constituted and that has conditioned our approach. A um, couple of quick pictures, the groundbreaking in 1937 uh, and, and uh, um, the original opening festivities in the uh, court in the rear. If you've never uh, seen it before, the pair of um, semicircular stairs that uh, that um, falls from the living room down to the circular lawn below. So there's the, the building shortly after completion, uh, one of the photographs that appeared in publications at the time. Uh, and you can see that it was, you know, it's a very clean building, uh, kind of modern in its cleanliness. It's a uh, brick, it was always painted. So the, you know, that was always the intent uh, with white marble trim, um, slate roofs, um, multi-light windows, um, casement windows in most locations, these unusual octagonal windows that led into uh, a two-story space, the conference hall. You can see that Greek revival portico on um, Bedford Terrace on the, the left-hand side of the image. And another view from a postcard. This is from a number of years later. You can see the, the car models have changed a little bit, but um, you know, still looking pretty much as it did at the at the time it was completed. And um, time has been, you know, re relatively kind to this building, but uh, there are elements that are starting to deteriorate, such as the slate roofs. You can see the. The gutters are, you know, the gutters are starting to show uh, corrosion through the, the metal and they did be replaced. The slate roofs are now 80 years old and the slates uh, need to be replaced in, in their entirety. On the right is a really remarkable feature, which is the kind of um, 
a mapped mural that is um, painted on a cork pinup board. And it was a way, uh, it, was, it was intended as a place to document where the alumni of uh, Smith College were from. So um, there's little plaques on each state and uh, even other countries outside the United States to document how many alumni were from there. Um, it's a wonderful piece, uh, but it's been, you know, it's, it's seen kind of abuse. You can see a, a desk that's been parked in front of it. So it's been bumped and banged, but um, it's going to be uh, restored as part of the interior work of the building. So um, the building as it existed and four plans, just to give you an idea, um, there's a lower level, uh, which uh, the, the building has uh, entrances at the rear at the lower level. Uh, the main level entrance comes into a kind of grand hall. Unfortunately, I'm not sure I can uh, use a pointer to present with here. So I'll have to let you use your eyes with this one. But um, there is this wonderful plan with the uh, conference hall on the west and the, the left hand side um, joined to a very large um, east wing by a curving uh, what we call the lake building which um, picks up on the, the curve in Elm Street and um, just unites the, the eastern parts of Elm Street as they head down the hill. And um, you know part of our program is about reaccommodating various uh, faculties within um, alumni house and uh, just bringing the building, um, HVAC systems, lighting, um, telecommunication systems. Um, but the other is to really uh, to make it good for another 50 years or so. So this is the, uh, the set of submitted documents. And I won't wade through them. I'm going to presume that the committee members have uh, walked through the summary. Can. Can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to ask other members, and, uh, other people are experiencing you breaking up or is it because it could be my computer or my bandwidth, but no, I'm, I'm having difficulty also. Okay. Yeah, so I, think we are, you know, yeah, I am too. I thought it was me. Yeah. That you're just breaking up sometimes, but I, I think we're getting pretty much everything you're saying eventually. Okay. I'm sorry. There must be some connectivity issues tonight. Um, Chris, if you shut your video off, that might help. Sometimes if yeah, you try okay. and do the screen sharing and the video. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Just see if I can shut this. No, just want to give me the full screen. Apologies. That's okay, take your time. Okay. Um, okay, I'm off the air visually here. We hear you though. <laughs> just, okay, good, very good. Uh, so I'm gonna zoom in here on the Elm Street elevation and just walk through some of the things that are going on here just to help navigate um, the changes being made or, or not so much changes as the, the work uh, proposed here. I'm going to start with the main entrance and um, uh, this, the entrance portico is going to be restored. The wood columns are retained and uh, stripped and restored. The fascia above the main entrance right now is uh, tempered hardboard, the original wood having rotted out some time ago or started to rot out. So it was temporarily covered up and the proposal is to put back uh, 
a glass reinforced cementitious pro product as a more durable fascia there. Um, the existing decorative cast metal cornice is being uh, restored in place. And uh, the existing, there's a pair of doors here, uh, which are too narrow for ADA access. So we're removing the pair of existing doors and replacing with a single larger glazed door and glazed side lights. Uh, so just that to note, but the existing uh, decorative cast metal panel uh, with the, the, the transom grill over the doors, which hides a, a glazed uh, transom light is, is retained, is restored and retained. Um, generally, as I mentioned, stripped of slate and uh, the slates are all being replaced. The copper gutters are being rebuilt in their entirety, um, as well as the copper fascia just below the roof here. Uh, the brickwork is being selectively repointed and repainted. Uh, uh, the marble um, trim lines, the uh, the marble string courses that are here are being uh, cleaned and restored. Uh, the windows are a mix. Uh, most of the windows you see in the east wing um, in this view are being replaced with new uh, thermally broken lights, uh, simulated um, divided lights. Uh, just if only to um, you know upgrade the energy performance where we can and offer people actual, you know, operable uh, windows, the current ones being double hung windows, which in many cases have lost their counterweights or, um, you know, are no longer operable because they're, they're racked or damaged. Um, however, as we, as we move to the link area, um, these, uh, the steel uh, doors and uh, side lights and transom lights at the ground level gallery that you're seeing at the center here are all being uh, removed and sent off site for restoration and uh, cleaning, restoration, rebuilding, and then returning to the site and being replaced. So the actual historic doors are being reinstated there after uh, some loving attention and care. We didn't feel that it was possible to um, do anything that would simulate the appearance of those doors. So the, the best option was to uh, basically have them removed and restored offsite. Um, the steel windows of the dormers, which are quite unusual because the steel uh, sash system wraps around to the um, refurbished in place. So new hardware and gaskets, but the, the steel is being um, restored and the glass is being rebuilt. Um, and then the conference hall windows, which are um, they're being uh, re retained and restored and reglazed. Similarly, the, the octagonal lights um, above them there, I, I, there just really is no replacement window product that makes sense there. And um, it just made sense to retain them. Uh, the highlights, can I flag the uh, being retained, uh, the woodwork is being cleaned up and restored. The existing lead coated copper roof is being uh, retained in place. So, you know, generally the, the the principle of what we are doing is, um, you know, retaining heritage elements where possible, um, and and that's virtually all the the elements uh, where things need to be replaced. They're being replaced in kind, um, the same materials, and um, in certain places we've we're introducing a few additions. One of them I'll highlight is this um, kind of dormer that we're adding on the east side of the conference hall wing. One, um, the, the attic over the conference hall encloses a, a very significant amount of space. And we're using it as a place to 
house new mechanical units that'll service both the conference hall <clears throat> and the link to the east of it. So in order to get um, ductwork out of there, and this is, you know, one of the things we're doing, and I'll just depart for a moment from that, is getting rid of a lot of uh, rooftop air conditioning units from the building. Uh, so we're cleaning up the, the rooftops of the building and replacing it with uh, mechanical systems that are housed inside the building, including the one that's in the conference hall. Um, you can see the height of the conference hall is almost the height of the, the ductwork uh, from the units in the conference hall, out of the conference hall and into the link building. Um, so we've had to construct this new uh, mansard on the roof. The strategy for that is for uh, it to be it to be faced in the same lead coated copper that um, consistent with the Bedford Terrace uh, roof. Uh, this element you're seeing is um, a safety rail on the roof uh, to allow maintenance people to get out and service exhaust fans. Um, this uh, chimney, which is an existing false chimney, in fact, is uh, it only springs from the link, uh, the link floor upwards, and it's really essentially decorative. It's meant to east, which is actually a real chimney with real fireplaces below. Um, we're repurposing the chimney for the uh, an exhaust on uh, the kitchen below. So there's an existing kitchen that serves the conference hall. Um, this. This gets a new exhaust unit. The exhaust will be actually out the top of the chimney, but the the fan will live beside this chimney. So we think we can eliminate about half of this railing system by relocating the fan to the west side of the chimney. Um, and we're working on that right now, but there's likely to be some kind of guard here just to meet OSHA requirements. And uh, the other couple of new things are the there's a rooftop ventilator on top of the conference hall. There's, it's an existing one. It's a louvered copper thing. Um, we have to replace that because again, like the gutters and fascias lower down, it's, it's now in poor shape and corrosion has at least holes in it and it's dented. And, um, so a, new, a pair of new ventilators will go on the roof of the conference hall. Uh, echoing what's there, but not in copper. That's just not um, possible to duplicate the look of today. And similarly, on top of the east wing, there's a couple of small ventilator units, which uh, serve some air handling units in the, the aft of the east wing. So there's really, um, I mean, we're, we're substantially maintaining uh, and substantially maintaining the appearance of the building from Elm Street, I would say. Um, very little is being modified and everything is being uh, lovingly restored where possible. And the balance of this set is, gets into a lot of uh, detail. It's probably not useful or necessary to go into right now. And I wonder whether I should just turn it over for questions and discussions at this point, unless Gary wanted to add something or uh, David, maybe I didn't cover something in my points. I think you covered it pretty completely in terms of uh, you know what's gonna change on the outside. And it's really not much. Um, in fact, not a lot's gonna change on the inside too, other than uh, it'll be all new systems and um, at least one new system. The building has never been uh, sprinklered before, so it will have fire protection that it's never had. Yeah, Gary makes a good point. There's a lot of <clears throat> life safety upgrades to the building um, that have happened to, to bring it up to the contemporary International Building Code uh, standard. One thing I would um, highlight that I didn't, touch on before is, and it's it's kind of disappeared off the, the right-hand side of this elevation. There's an existing fire escape that was constructed in the 1960s 
Um, and it's not in wonderful condition. Uh, we had talked to the constructors about uh, maintaining it in place and doing certain modifications to it. Um, eventually they came back and said, it would be much less expensive to simply rebuild it in its entirety in that location. So uh, I think most people are accustomed to seeing this fire escape. Um, we're, we're looking at it from the, uh, the north side now, so back towards Elm Street. Most people are accustomed to seeing it. It will um, be replaced by something that looks very much like it, but is of contemporary manufacture and galvanized and will um, uh, last another 50 years. Um, so Chris, do you, are there um, any before you elevation? Go, can I? Uh, I just wanted to say, as you know, I, I just um, wanted to make sure we are before... responsible that for, um, you know, anything that's visible from a public way. So my question would be, are there changes to the west facade? Um, essentially, no, Martha, it's, um, I should have probably done some annotations on this one, but the west facade on Bedford, and I'll just zoom into the portion that's really visible here, um, the wood elements, the, the pediment and the four columns are simply stripped and restored, repainted. The brickwork is selectively repointed and repainted. Uh, the two existing windows to the conference hall, the large ones and the octagonal ones are um, restored, reglazed, repainted. Um, the slate roofs are uh, re-slated and the copper gutters are re rebuilt in copper. Uh, we're leaving the, the lead coated copper roof on the pediment here uh, as is. So really, really no uh, tangible changes. Even, even the, uh, the light hanging in the portico is going to be uh, removed, restored, repainted, and reinstalled. OK, great. Thank you. Barbara, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I did have a question, because um, when you are walking up Bedford Terrace, you can see the back elevation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I don't know north, south, but the, the back of the building. And I think that may be where you're changing some windows to doors and doors to windows or changing some windows. So could you just show us that? Also? Sure, uh, sure. We're just looking at that right now. So this is what you would see walking um, north, southwards on uh, Bedford Terrace. So, uh, you know, again, we're retaining these windows and uh, basically all of these windows through this area are being retained. These are new windows at the, the lower level uh, and that's a new door. Uh, it's actually, in a, there's an existing door in that location, but there's a, a new door in the doorway. Uh, so everything, you know, from the kind of foundation up is essentially the same. Um, what else as we move? Um, eastwards here, I believe. Okay, so all of the, the dormer windows are, the steel windows are being restored and retained. Um, these are new uh, simulated divided light windows, I think, correct, David? This part of the wing. <laughs> David's missing. Um, can you just, can you specify how what kind of simulated divided light are they? Is it between panes of glass or how, how, how are, the, what kind of windows are they? They're, well, it's, it's simulated. So there's, uh, you know, surface grillage uh, visible from the exterior, uh, but the actual panes of glass are not divided, not physically divided. They're, you know, they appear right. to be divided. But, but is that grill, you said it's, it's on the inside and the so, outside? Or just on the outside or just um, on one I, I believe it's both. Oh, okay. And it's fixed as opposed to a removable grill? 
well, I think they're all to some extent removable to replace glazing if necessary. Uh -huh. right. they're, they're typically held on with a, a, a kind of glue. So they are, they do come off, but they don't, they don't pop off. You know, okay. if the glass breaks, you've got to replace um, the, the applied uh, mutton bars. Right. It's, this, it's the same um, window manufacturer that was used at Nielsen Library. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, do the commissioners have questions for the applicant? And um, I typically go around on this one. Anybody uh, would like to begin? I did have a couple other questions mm -hmm. because on the elevation that faces Elm Street, I see the the biggest the biggest change to me that I that I'm seeing is the changing the original doors. And I understand that you have to do this to be ADA compliant, but is it possible to see that? Um, yeah. Um, In detail. Maybe a little bigger, but I don't know if people are familiar. It's, it's they're wooden doors, right? That are have some kind of decoration on them. And they're mm -hmm. double doors mm -hmm. that, that just open out you know, from the middle. And to me, this is, you know, and this is now just the top, the top is glazed, you're saying, and the bottom is a wood panel? Correct. So the, the new, right. there's a tran transom light with a metal grillage in front right, of right. it. Right, right. And then, as you say, there, there's a pair of doors here, but you can imagine right. they're, they're quite narrow. They're, they're simply too narrow. No, to I know. Fit, I've, uh, I've, I've walked through them many times. I know, okay. I know exactly <laughs> what they're like. I understand. But, um, it just it it seems like a like a significant change, and I I don't know if there's another solution, but um, it it just looks like a much not that it doesn't go somewhat with the rest of the building, but it just seems like a a much more modern thing, not really um, appropriate to the building. It is, it, well, we tried to be, you know, it's a, it's a wood style and rail door with a glazed light. So mm -hmm. we just, we tried to be right. as faithful to the um, style of the building while, you know, creating a large single door. Um, right. You don't, do you, you well, don't have a picture anywhere of the door that's there now. Um, it would take me, a, it would just take me a while to come up with one. <laughs> and I don't oh, want to hang don't, everybody up. Don't here. worry about that so much. Um, and I'm also, I was glad to hear you say that that OSHA railing on the roof is probably going to be considerably smaller because that seemed a little jarring to me. Yeah. It, and I, I know that you just, sometimes you just, you have to do things to fulfill certain um, requirements, but. Um, it, it's uh, one thing I would say is that it's set back towards the north side of the roof. So. Yeah. You know, um, right. it won't be as visible as it is in the elevation, because mm -hmm. the the parallax of you know the forward the leading edge of the roof will conceal right. much of that railing. Right. Okay. Um, well, that's the, just going back to the doors, though, because I wanted to respond well, to your sure. question. Um, we entertain some other options, and one was to go with an unequal pair of doors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we do that sometimes in contemporary buildings where we need, you know, we have a restricted opening size, but we need to maintain a, an opening size that works for um, barrier-free purposes. Uh, but it just seemed, when we drew it, it seemed so out of keeping, you know, because of its asymmetry, so out of keeping with the appearance of the building mm -hmm. that uh, it just didn't feel comfortable. We felt that a symmetrical arrangement of a single door was the most appropriate thing we could do. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's tricky without altering the width of that existing doorway, which, you know, if you've if you've seen that, um, you know what that entrance is like. It's you know it's a it's three quarter circular in plan, and uh, the doorway is circumscribed by the the width of the brick opening. 
it's behind it. Um, right, right. No, I understand. I just feel like, I mean, it's, and this is not on you at all, obviously, but Smith sort of has a habit of getting rid of really wonderful carved figured doors and replacing them with glass doors, which they did in Nielsen Library. This was many, many years ago, but, um, and, so I sort of, I really hate to see these, um, these original wooden doors disappearing around campus. Agreed, agreed. It's, um, you know, it's unfortunate to see them go. I have go a ahead. photograph you, that I could share. If, um, Gary and I have had this discussion many <laughs> times. <laughs> you want me to share the image? Well, I would certainly like to see it soon, and I would love the other commissioners to see what's there now if they're not familiar with it. Sure. It says I cannot share while somebody else is sharing. Okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing, let you have it. Okay. Can everyone see that? Mm. Uh -huh. Is everyone seeing the? Uh, yeah. Words? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think one of the things that um, uh, is troubling me a little bit, bit about this is the proportions of the, the new door, the, the sizes, of, the size of the glass, the two, the upper panel, well, both panels, but the glass panel and the lower panel, which I believe is wood. Um, you know, it sort of lacks a grace that this door has a very elongated kind of willowy, graceful feel to it. And those big, a big block of glass mm -hmm. um, and then the big wood panel below just, um, it's sort of like a middle linebacker came in and is standing in for the running back. Probably not a very good analogy, but um, I so I just wonder if there's a way just ask you to look at this that you know maybe that the size of that glass panel maybe that could be reduced or it could be made into two um separated by um you know by wood i, I don't know but i just ask you to look at that because i think that's what that's what's troubling me is just the bulkiness of it the blockiness when you have this lovely elongated graceful existing for thank you for articulating that for me more martha oh, you're welcome my my issues with it but i certainly understand the problem because you have to you know these are probably what like 27 inches wide or something uh, yeah exactly about yeah. 28 i think okay each of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's tricky um yeah we'll have another look at it and see if we can you know bring mm -hmm. A more refined proportion to things you know just the, the overall figure of the door is that much larger which uh, does give it that kind of you know less elegant feel frankly mm -hmm. yeah we yeah. we were also hoping to um allow people to see in um in fact uh, there the the there's a portion of the east wing that right now is or well, the building is almost empty right now, but uh, it was administrative offices. So the executive offices were um, to the right as you walk in. Um, and that will all be public space. And that space will be called the Welcome Center. So, um, you know, as I look at this, I see a pair of fairly plain, um, opaque doors, not very inviting. True. Um, and the the single leaf wider leaf makes it uh, fully accessible and uh, the addition of the the glass um i think really uh you know lets people see in and um i, I think if, yeah i hope i think the plan the desire is to increase uh traffic through that door so that that is part of the uh the design okay yeah, I, that's a good point. I don't think the objection is to the glass so much as just the the lines and proportions. The proportion, yep. Yeah, yeah I, I have to admit, I, I have a preference for um, vertical form uh, over horizontal form. Um, I, I, in fact, I've thought more than once that a full glass would look better than a half glass on that door. Hmm. 
that's also worth looking at. And, and I also have one more question about this elevation and maybe Gary, if, if, if the other- um, Why don't I get rid of my- could get put up. Um, Because I know that a lot of the windows on the side facing Elm Street, you said you are going to um, repair either in situ or send off, but, or, or send somewhere else and bring back. Um, but I think it's the windows to the right of the door, Whoop, not, not on that elevation, but um, that the windows on the far right, maybe they're one, two, three, four, five window. Those windows you said you are going to replace? Yes. Um, with this, um, you know, and again, these simulated divided lights. And I'm just wondering why, and I don't know if there are other windows around the corner that you're all, yeah, well, I guess you're doing that with some on the back, but you mentioned something about the, um, you know, the rope and pulley system not working, but um, I feel like we tend to prefer if windows can be repaired, that they be repaired. And um, so I just have questions about that. And I'm still not sure I'm happy with the kind of simulated divided light that's going to be there. It did. Uh, I will say we did spend a lot of time looking at <clears throat> how these windows could be stripped and repaired. Um, and you know, with uh, lights replaced, you know, single pieces of glass replaced with thermal lights. And there was one kind of uh, artisanal uh, supplier that was doing that kind of work, but um, it was it was shaky. It was a you know one person operation and uh, not terribly reliable, and the cost was astronomical. We felt it was really critical to you know at least partially address energy issues here, both at the seals of the windows and the, the insulating characteristics of the lights. So. The really iconic windows, I think we've made an effort to save and, you know, we just felt the, the secondary windows was, um, were an opportunity to save some energy and get some better performance and, you know, get better functioning windows so people can actually operate them when they want to. Um, I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a judgment call, I would say, I mean, it's, um, I appreciate that you know one wants to retain those heritage windows, and uh, it would be great if there was a way to refurbish them. But it's just not what we found was that it was not that available. You know, it's not on a kind of commercial scale like this. So typically, um, Chris, just so you know, we we do not. Um, accept simulated divided lights that are applied to the glass. Um, we do uh, uh, accept simulated divided lights with a spacer bar between the insulating glass. This is in our guidelines. Um, and I have to say we have um, stopped a few other um, property owners on Elm Street from doing just this uh, not that long ago, actually very recently. And so um, I, my, my question would be, have you looked at the option of doing the um, spacer bar between the glass and we, the cost analysis of the, that. Yeah, these these are these windows do have spacer bars. Oh. Yeah, I may I may have misled you. A oh, okay, bit I thought there. you said that the grills were just applied to the glass. They are applied. So there's three pieces. There's the spacer bar in the middle, oh. and then there's applied um, okay. grills on either side. You'd be very hard pressed to figure out mm -hmm. the difference. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes, that's a little bit different. The other properties weren't doing that, so. Um, do other members have questions? Harvey? Uh, no, I think I'm good, thanks. Jonathan? You're muted. I'm fine. <laughs> Okay. Unmuted. unmuted. Um, Dylan. Uh, I, I think you've all eloquently addressed the things which came up to me. The railing was the first thing that stuck out to me. Um, I'm, I think you just have to find a balance between what's visible from the street and the regulations by which you have to operate um, the door. 
stuck out to me and 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 the windows, but I, I think we've addressed those here. Um, so I'm good. Okay. And is Craig still on? Yep, I am. My main question, what is the timeline on this project? The project is, um, has much, much of the work has already been bid. Uh, we have a, a construction manager on board, uh, Shamit. We're the same construction manager that worked on the Nielsen Library project. Uh, so uh, they're currently negotiating with trades and um, the buildings being cleared out and getting ready to start um, hazardous materials abatement um, within the next month. Any other when questions? Will it be complete? Yeah, Craig. Craig, the schedule is uh, we have a soft start mid-May, hard start in early June, fence goes up, you know, site is uh, blocked off. Um, and demolition will be complete by mid-August, thereabouts. Um, and the total project completion is roughly the end of July of summer of 22. And we'll uh, have a soft opening in, in August, moving people back in. and. Uh, we hope no open the doors to the public again by September 1. Thank you so much. That was my main question. Any other questions from the commissioners? Okay. Um, does anyone feel like they want to, uh, are ready to make a motion on this to get that on the table and then we could have further discussion? I'm ready. Would you like to make the motion, Jonathan? Sure. Okay. I'm not getting a seconder. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. I, I don't have much to say. I, I'm, oh, I'm asking for some, we're, we're going to vote. Yeah. Um, we need a motion that has to be seconded and, and, and then further discussion. Would anyone like to do that? I thought that's what you were saying. You wanted to make the motion. Sure. I, I the motion would be to approve, right? Uh, approve as presented? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does second. anyone want to second that? I'll second. Okay, Harvey, thank you. Any discussion? Um, I, I'll just offer that I, I would like there to be another uh, round looked at for the main entry door, just based on the discussion that we had. You know, whether it's, um, you know, single glass, it's uh, two elongated panes of glass. I think that the elongated proportions are, are more appropriate for this. And I think I would be more comfortable with that. Robert, do you want to comment because you were? Well, I would. I would like that to be part of the motion as well. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Sarah, how would we handle that? Can we? Um, I'm. Uh, I'm like, fine with modifying the motion. Okay. That we would have to do that. But, um, Sarah, my question is: um, Would can we um, put a condition on the motion? Sure. On the vote? Uh, so it depends on. How the commission is with um, with what's being presented. You know, if you just want the applicant to consider something alternate and lay out what that is, mm -hmm. and then leave that up to um, it would be building department approval. In this instance, that would be fine. If you wanted to review that, you could do that at your meeting in May. Although it sounds like that potentially may hold the project up because they wouldn't be able to move forward. Um with anything until they have the certificate, correct? I mean, they could pull a building permit for everything but the door. So we could make it very clear to the building department that that, that part, that portion of it wouldn't be approved and anything else the commission discusses from here. Okay, I would be comfortable with that. Um, others want to weigh in on it? I'd like to add in my thoughts about <clears throat> overall difference of we're seeing recently. I would like in future presentations like this where we all are paying close attention to doors and windows. We should have not just 
long distance views of architectural drawings. I would like to see existing conditions, the future, uh, future doors and windows up close and detailed drawings as part of any presentation that comes before this board. That's the main thing we're always talking about and we're not, maybe it's just the zoomness here, but it doesn't seem to be we're seeing the full picture, but I don't let it go at that. I think all future meetings need to be more encompassing. Yeah, so to be fair to the applicant, they did include these, um, and uh, you know, there's these demolition photos, or excuse me, drawings do show um, the existing door and then the proposed. Um, that's what I looked at when I was referring to this. But I, I think, Greg, Craig, you make a good point, and we'll certainly mm -hmm. um, register that and convey that to few future applicants. Um, so it sounds to me, unless there are other comments from the commissioners, um, we may, I think we need to amend the motion. And um, Jonathan, would you like to do that? Uh, yes, I'd like to, maybe Sarah can give us the, the exact wording that would be helpful. I mean, the intent is very clear. Yeah, and so we had a general discussion of a more elongated door design, but um, not really anything too specific yet. Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to flesh that out a little bit more. Well, I think that what we had asked is that they explore um, instead of the proportions, which are more horizontal and blocky, um, an arrangement in the door that just emphasizes the vertical line. So whether it's you know one pane of glass or it's um, two long panes of glass or four um, uh, four panels. Um, maybe two glass and uh, the other wood. Um, I think we need to see it's an option. And I, I guess, Jonathan, what I would say is I'd like to have the motion amended so that we do award the certificate, but um, we would like to see the door again in May. That's fine. I, and I don't think it, it holds things up at all. It shouldn't. Do we need a second for an amended motion? We do. Because I, sec I would second the amended motion. Okay. That's right. Okay. Any more discussion? All right. I think we're ready to take a vote. It's Martha? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Craig? Yes. And Barbara? Yes. All right, that's unique. I think this is the first Smith College thing I've been able to vote on because I don't work there anymore. And <laughs> that's right. Nothing came before us <laughs> in the past. I will, I will also follow up that, Barbara. I, I really do appreciate the effort that Smith and the architects have made to um, adhere, adhere to the materials, um, particularly the details in the marble, the slate roof, um, all of the metal, the copper, the standing seam copper roof, all that is so, so important. And um, I think we all appreciate that Smith is, you know, devoting the resources to doing this correctly. Absolutely. So thank you. Great. So, uh, just as a quick thing, I, Barbara's comment reminds me of this. So my wife works at Smith. Does that mean I should not vote on that one? I mean, at this point I could just, you know, retroactively refuse myself, that would be better. I, I wouldn't think so, Sarah. Um, That's most likely. Right. Uh, you might want to check about that in the future, um, but it, yeah, you might want to recuse yourself sort of retroactively. It's probably fine going forward, just but just to avoid any potential appearance of impropriety. Got it. I, I, and I can send you some more information about how to do that. All right, thank you um, for um, appearing. Well, th thank you. Thank I appreciate you. everyone's time this evening. And um, 
I, I think the, the door does actually deserve another a re revisit in May and we'll look forward to being before you once again to present the door. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Um, the and next said, one. Unless you yes. want me to say, can I say goodbye? Yes, Gary, you can say goodbye. All right. Hey, goodbye. Gary. Thank you. But thank you, Gary. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, update on the proposed National Register District nominations for the Florence um, Abolition Re and Reform District. And we have Steve Strymer here. Um, Steve, thank you so much for uh, submitting all the information about it. I have to say, I didn't get through the whole thing, but it's going to be good reading. I can um, you know, beautifully compose at least the part that I read. Do you have a presentation for us? And you're muted. I, I don't have a presentation really. I have a slideshow as a, as a thing that I did a while back for um, uh, for our, we had a symposium at the Ruggles Center for our, our anniversary and the anniversary of the Northampton Association. But it, it takes a little time. Um, I don't know. I, if I would rather, uh, if people do have questions, and I, I have a couple questions myself, um, that, that might be a better use of the time unless people are unclear, maybe the new members are un unclear about what this is about. Is that the case? Probably, and we could all use a little refresher. So why don't you give us a brief update and then let us know where you are in the process and what you think the time frame is, mm -hmm. who's involved. Okay. Well, um, do you want to give me a screen share? Sarah? And Harvey I'm and good. I can share my screen. Set. I see it down there. Yeah. All right. And Harvey and Jonathan, just so you understand, uh, Steve is um, the head of the Ruggles Center. Yeah, I know. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay, he's not the head. He's no, the mover I, and shaker at the maybe, Ruggles. Maybe in one, one form, but I'm trying to retire, you know. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> All right. You still do a lot of work. <laughs> so uh, do people see this? This is the, the district. I have it up here. Uh, and I don't know if new members are know Florence very well. It's um, somewhat of a large district, I would guess. Um, but it, we wanted to include, if you see the green areas that we have here, we wanted to include uh, landscapes that were important to the association. So if you see this, uh, this one up here, um, this section right here is the uh, Grow Food Northampton Farm and the CSA and the playing fields, which uh, I think in a great stroke of serendipity are the almost the exact footprint of the Agricultural Department of the Northampton Association. Um, I think maybe I will, let's see, I just, can you give me a second? Oh, um, sure. I'm gonna this see is, if I this is a great uh, map. I haven't seen this before. This is fabulous. Yeah, and we're wondering whether we, I don't know if, uh, you know, as I go in, I'll show you the, uh, uh, the resolution. This is what Neil Larson, who's the architectural, whoop, the architectural historian that was involved with this. Uh, it's not the highest resolution. The black line is what's, uh, what is included in the district. Mm -hmm. um, and so for orientation, uh, this is the Ross Homestead, which is already on the National Register. Have people been up there to see it recently? Mm -hmm. um, I have. Not recently. Um, I want to, I guess that's what I'd like to show and maybe this will work. Okay. Uh, to do this first. I don't know. I'm not great at this stuff, but um, let me just check. Um, where is it? Slideshow district. Uh, okay. If I open it twice. It seems like it works. Oh, wait. I'm 
There we go. So this is what I showed people uh, when we did our, our thing. Um, it's a long title, but uh, here is uh, the gist of the story. Um, Catherine Grover, uh, who is the historian doing this, um, I, I was pitching, I was saying how lucky we are to have her in this. She wrote this almost essential book on the Underground Railroad in New Bedford. Um, and she felt it would be better to approach this two ways. One, have a national historic district and two, have a larger context statement for Northampton as a whole for abolition and reform and African-American presence. So that's how she approached it. And then I went on and the two houses we already have on the National Register is this one at 191 Nonatuck Street, the home of Basil Dorsey, a formerly enslaved citizen. And uh, um, then let's why do I have this map? This is a great map. I, um, and see here this Jones down here. You know, I always wondered what that was for a while. Well, we found out it's uh, this fellow, Thomas H. Jones. So this house on Nonatuck Street, and, I, and I'll, I'll think of these two properties as sort of like the linchpin of this district because they're already on the National Register. And so that house was the home of Basil Dorsey. And then four years later was the home of this gentleman who wrote this slave narrative and moved on to uh, New Bedford for the rest of his life after Florence. But this is the Ross homestead now, uh, the, the yellow color, which it was sort of a ochre yellow for a while. And these wonderful building restorers, Colonial Homes uh, now owns the property and it's done a, a major job. This is the barn that is with, is with the property now. Um, and then um, the other part of the pitch for the historic district, understanding its value, is that houses like this, which is Sojourner Truth's house, um, we call it, um, probably would never have a standalone uh, National Register designation because it, it's been built around her, her little story and a half house is inside this house. Mm -hmm. uh, you, and similarly, uh, well, this, this house is a lot like it was. Um, let's see, I'm going around and this is David Ruggles house. Um, and Ruggles, uh, I encourage historical commission people to familiarize themselves with her. So Journer Truth is well known, but Ruggles sort of is becoming more prominent and recognized as a, an essential abolitionist in the whole story of abolitionism in, in, the, in New England and, and uh, New York. And this is where he established his water cure. He came to Florence and became a uh, hydropathic doctor and started his water cure in this little house. Again, it couldn't probably be on the National Register itself. It's been modified, but it's also was moved from its original location, which usually disqualify these kind of properties. But to have a district will help, help Northampton remember it and be able to, in a way, in our unusual, our sort of way of just pointing to these properties to preserve them. Um, here's another shot of Basil Dorsey's house. Um, this house, it, I've been going around with Neil in this house, and I think I'm about to give in to him. He says, <clears throat> we pretty much agreed it, it can't be really considered Charles Burley's house. And Charles Burley was this wonderful, uh, important, under underappreciated uh, abolitionist who settled in Florence became the speaker of the Free Congregational Society. But um, I don't want to go on and on because that's my style is just to you know, keep going and going. I, I do want for this, because we don't get together all the time, I want to address any questions that come up from people, especially the new members of the commission if they want me to stop. But we'll, we'll figure out, I'll bet you anything though, that asked parts of the Burley house were used to build this house, I'm almost certain. Mm -hmm. But Neil's reluctant to, uh, to, to designate it as Burley's house. Um, here's a, a, we have several great glass negative collections, one of which is Historic Northampton in the um, 
the Howes Brothers collection. And this, here's one uh, that looks basically exactly like this. And they've done a decent job of renovating it recently. Um, so we're what going around the neighborhood. Uh, this, uh, this house on Spring Street possibly could have, a lot of these could have there, they do have form Bs, um, all but three or four of these proper properties have form Bs. Um, this is Henry Anthony's house, the longest tenured African-American we know of in Florence, um, was one of the signers of the call to resist the fugitive slave law. There were 10 fugitive slaves that called Northampton to meeting in 1850 and in our brand new city hall, um, had it called the meeting to resist the fugitive slave law. A uh, pretty unique situation. And that's largely the gist of the story is that Northampton and Florence together provide one of the best ways of talking about what went on in abolition in this period in the, in the Northeast. Um, this I guess I have a general question, Steve, okay. and that is all these houses have people living in them, of course. Uh, is there any opposition to uh, historic district and all that, or, or are people basically on board with, with this? Well, that hasn't been thoroughly tested, but like almost virtually all the houses you see here, I've been in touch with the owners and been in and I'm assuming they'll, I, I, maybe it's an assumption I shouldn't make. And I think that is an ongoing concern of the Massachusetts Historical Commission that, that this can become controversial. But um, I don't, I just think we've laid a lot of good um, sort of PR and over time, you know, the last 12 years we've spent trying to um, have people be proud of this history of all, of all stripes. I mean, there's no, yeah. let's put it this way. There's no time like the present to try. Sure. You know, and, and there's no, no noisy opposition at this there's point. There's no, no, there's no noisy opposition. And I've, uh, I haven't, Good. and that's why I kind of uh, hope that you all would keep the lid on for a while longer because I'm not quite prepared um, where things stand in the draft process is that uh, Neil now has Catherine's um, second draft from my markups and he's incorporating the, her narrative into the forms that the National Register uh, Mass Historical Commission uh, demands that you put it in this. And then we're going to do another proofread at that point. And um, I would send that out to you all again um, when, that, when that's ready. And that the draft that will go to the Mass Historical Commission could come within the next month, I think. Wow, but that's then, great. But, th but then it's in their court. And Neil says they can, they can take a long time. Long time. Yeah. I don't know. Well, also, unlike a, a local historic district, this doesn't carry any design review right. ramifications like like the uh, Elm Street Historic District does, like we just saw with Smith. So none of these property owners would need to go through any additional permitting processes for anything that they wanted to do at all, exactly. in, including you know complete demolition or drastic modifications to their houses. So um, generally, there's a, a public meeting that's held where we explain the difference between a local register district and a national register district. And when people understand that, you know, this is really just a recognition of how incredibly important this area is, uh, any opposition that potentially they may have had generally goes away. Um, but th that's something we should look at having before yes, the, and, this gets- And Mass Historical does started. take a long time. Um, I've, I've been part of that myself. Um, but I will say, I think they have one of the best records in the country of any state about getting their um, nominations approved by the National Park Service. So once they, it gets through the Mass Historical Review and approval, it's pretty much a done. Yeah, and they've worked with this team. And Neil Larson and Catherine Grover did both the Ross Homestead and the Dorsey Jones House. And Betsy Freeberg, um, Mrs. Partly how it began was a member of the Massachusetts Underground Railroad Network 
would come to all of our meetings uh, that we had back in 2004 and five. We stopped meeting, but she's she's encouraged me and them to do this. So, yeah, and I would think that um, because of that, Steve, it, they would give it priority. And also, it's such an important theme. Um, I know when the so, so again for the new members, um, this project was funded in part by the Community Preservation Committee. And um, the review of this at our committee meetings was just, it was so moving and everyone on the committee and then also the people present were just really impressed by it and really moved by it and so happy that it was happening. So there's tremendous support for it. Anyway. So that's, I mean, I can go, like I said, I can go on and on. There's some great stories, of course. And, uh, I would encourage you to read Catherine's document. It's it's a good read, and and uh, and it, both of them. The, the context for Northampton is important, and she does. You might be interested. She does do a fair amount on George Washington Cable uh, in this, um, and um, the People's Institute as and and has him and his approach be somewhat as a foil for Samuel L. Hill's approach, you know. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, and I'd love the, uh, so can I uh, go ahead and ask me any other questions? I, I just wanted to bring up a couple things while I have you. Does anybody yeah. have questions? I have some questions. Correct. Okay. So what do you need from us tonight? It's just like a, is this just a in progress report? Introduce yourself to the new members. What? What's yep. going on here? What's the next steps? Yeah, um, that's that's it. Um, I'm, you know, the the work I have to do. You know, Neil's naming of the historic homes. Uh, he calls all the all those. If we go back to the, let's see if I can do this. Um, hold on. If we go back to the map. All of these, one of the wonderful things about Florence is most of these houses that border on this, that are between the 45 or so important houses that can, that I considered really contributing, right? I, I don't have my nomenclature right because he, Neil considers it, these all, most, a lot of these houses that are in the 1860s and 50s from North Florence are contributing, right? But there's like highlights. I don't know what the, Martha and Sarah, do you have any idea how I should be talking about those? Well, you're saying you're surprised they're contributing because they're, um, less, they've been modified, that they didn't don't know, that, the, that the people who own them were less important than the ones that we feature. Were the people that own them part of this community though? No, they were part of the later community in a sense, you know? Okay. What? Well, you know, I know that probably just from looking at this map, and this is a guess, um, that Neil is probably trying to create a contiguous district here yep. so that the properties all connect. So I'm thinking, you know, you've got stuff down in Nonotuck, you know, extending way out. I don't know if they're, meaning way um, would be east here. Um, I don't know if there are other properties, there are in properties in that row that are not really part of are what are part of what you're describing they're they're later they're the people weren't as involved um he's probably just trying to make a boundary that will keep all this in a nice you know polygon exactly um yeah and then you know you can and have non i know initially they they had looked at doing um oh, I, I know initially they looked at doing a non-contiguous district but those can be really tough yeah. So exactly what Martha said, it seems like they're just trying to tie it all together so that any of the houses that are in the right era, even if they're not, they've been really modified. Yeah, and I would imagine, because Neil's worked with Mass Historical so much that he's been in touch with Betsy Friedrich about that. Um, Betsy, J Jonathan and um, Harvey, just for your information, uh, Betsy Friedrich is the National Register Director and Mass Historical, um, so she deals with, she's the head of the register effort for the state. And I would imagine Neil's been dealing with her, um, he's going to be communicating with her about this. And I think what you're 
bringing up as part of the logic or contributing to to Catherine's idea of having a context as well, because she's able to discuss, and you'll read about Anna Paul, who uh, was taken in by the community, was shunned by people in Massachusetts because she had married a black preacher. Uh, Garrison became very interested in her, and she lived up on North Farms, uh, North Farms Road which is clearly outside the district, but she's discussed within the context, if you know what I mean. So um, it, that was the way we were gonna cover as much as we can of this period and all the people. And, and I, um, I just wanna say, Steve, I haven't, I didn't get through all of this yet either, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and I, I'm just so impressed by all the research that's been done. And, and, again, and as Martha said, how well written it is and how well documented all this history is. And I feel that as the Historical Commission prepares its um, uh, preservation plan that we would wanna ask to have things like this as appendices or certainly at least in a list of references um, that would help guide what it is that we wanna preserve in our community. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's really great work for that to help us develop priorities and sections and you know, parts of Northampton to really look at and why are they important and um, the, the, full, the full historical story and cultural story. So you've done a lot of our work for us from, for Florence already. I think that's really and, uh, true. It's gonna be yeah. very, very informative for us when we are doing our preservation plan. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good observation. And no, we don't have that many National Register districts in Northampton. So it's fantastic that this is moving ahead and it's it's getting done pretty quickly. And the last one we did, Pomeroy Terrace, took what, like 15 years or something. Um, so this is great that it's moving along so quickly. Um, do other yeah. people have questions? I would just like to say, I, I read the narrative and the, and the context today. And it's just, it's fantastic to see all of this work. I mean, I've been living with some of this information for 30 years or so going on walking tours and, and to see it all in one place and laid out so well is it's just remarkable. And it really, it really tells the story. So I just like to thank you all for this incredible work. And I'll weigh in. <laughs> yep, and it couldn't have happened without your dad. <laughs> Um, one of the things I uh, want, can I have two just tangential things really quick? Yeah. You yep. have time? Mm -hmm. um, do people know the Crazy Noodle building that's downtown? Um, it's um, it's yeah. over across the street from what Fresh Pasta used yes. to be. Right. Yeah. If you look at the Form B for that, it's really inadequate for how important that building is. Um, and I wanted Catherine, I made a big argument to, for Catherine at the end, because I realized why would I not, as a person who's been involved with cooperatives all my life, not have put this building forward to be in, included in what could be considered reform, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted people to be aware of it and a new form B, how to approach getting a new form B. I talked a little bit with Sarah about that. Um, and I don't know if anybody else who's, uh, whether we can en enlist um, Bonnie or some, or, or anybody else or figure out a way to get the proper form B. This was established, that building was built. If you look at the 1873 uh, map, there's, it's an empty lot where it was. And this building was built specifically as the Equal Rights Assembly Hall with the, uh, and it was a, built to be a, um, I don't know if people know about the Rochdale Co-ops, but it was built to be a Rochdale Co-op store and has members. And Dylan and I have, have put together a, enough to do a good form B on it. Um, it also brings up, and it's gonna happen Catherine realizes she touched, she concentrated on what interested her. One of the reasons why she didn't want to include it, it also brought in Dyer Lum, 
Do pe are people aware of Dyer Lum as a person in our history? One of the reasons why that co-op didn't last even a year or maybe a little, maybe at most a year was that one of our, probably one of our people was involved in the Haymarket riot and deeply involved. If people want to look up Dyer Lum, who's buried in the Park Street Cemetery, he was one of the main print, the principals in the Haymarket affair. So it's, it's a great chunk of history that's going to be left out of this district and I wish it had made it in, but I'll claim it's mostly my fault. If I'd have pitched it earlier, she'd have included it. It does bring up the one other thing of, if we find out new stuff, this district is really like, can be considered a place with a lot of drawers and we can put appendices on this district. And that's what in the end, Catherine encouraged me to do about this. So to people reading this, like Dylan reading this, if you see stuff that was left out, right? Write it up because we can include it in what, even in what's filed with the state, I think is what Catherine was saying. All right, so that's basically it. So I have one final question and that is, it's almost seven, um, is how many of these folks who lived in this district and were part of this movement are buried at Park Street Cemetery? A lot. Like how many? 30. Wow. Um, That's great. I can, I can check that. One of the things we do is this walking tour of the cemetery and the houses of 13 houses that and have a little box of, of for primary source stuff for the people at the cemetery. It's mm -hmm. for mostly for students. Mm -hmm. And then we walk to the houses they had and there's, you know, really good ones like Sojourner's house and, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, there's Park Street Cemetery is, I'm just so happy uh, if people haven't been up there, the, uh, the work that was done on the stones was just beautiful. Yeah. The Basil Dorsey family now, it really looks like a family. It's really great. She lined them up just perfect. And the Burley Stone looks great. Mm -hmm. And I really was happy to work with everybody on that. It came out just fantastic. Great. Okay, Steve, well, thank you. Um, well, we do have one hand up, I noticed. Is it um, Fred? Um, is there Fred? Um, I think it might uh, just be a quick there. question. A quick question, where can we find- but, um, the, Could you uh, identify yourself, please? please? Oh, sorry, right. Fred yeah. Zimnock, Ward 3? Yeah. Uh, the other National Historic District. Um, can you tell me where where you can see this application or narrative? For Pomeroy Terrace? No, 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 for Florence, the one we're talking about. Oh, for Florence, okay. Where it's, can we see it? Are you, are you a member of the commission? No. Yeah, just for a little while longer, um, we're trying not to have it go out because it's still being proofread and things like that can lead to errors getting in to the thing. So I mean, if you would, if you would swear not to share it with any re reporters or anything, um, Sarah can get you my email and I can send it off, but that would be the kind of terms I'd want that you wouldn't share it with anybody. Uh, it would only be for my curiosity, thank you. Yeah, so we can do that if uh, Sarah wants to get you my email or something. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Okay, um, we'll see, we'll look forward to um, another installment of this at some point, but thank you so much for the update. It sounds like it's coming along great and I'm sure you'll have no problem. You know, getting it. Um, Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple other items on the agenda, and I, I'm going to uh, push the demolition review discussion off to our next meeting because it is seven o'clock. Um, if that's okay with everyone else, I'm making an executive decision on that. Um, Sarah, is there any mail to be reviewed? There is not. Okay. Um, any other business of the commissioners that um, was not on the agenda? Okay, um, then we will, I will entertain a motion to adjourn and we'll be meeting again at the end of May.
Uh, I don't know the exact date. But that yeah. will be one second. Yeah. Uh, May 24th? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's, I think it's the 31st. I think May uh, 24th is Memorial Day. I think it's really early oh. this year. Okay. I don't, Martha, I don't know if John Skibisky was is trying to say something. If you are, John, you're muted. But just before we adjourn, you're, you're still muted, John. We can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, very good. I had sent in material uh, to you in regards to the Native American site on Hatfield Street. Did you receive the material? I was um, supposed to be on the agenda today. John, my understanding is that um, the material did not reach the planning office before the agenda was published. And so um, the commissioners have not seen it. I've seen some of it um, just as a chair, but the commissioners have not seen it. And I think if we want to um, bring up the subject, everyone needs to review all of the information because there's a lot and it's a complicated um, situation. Yes. So what I would propose is that um, the information be shared with us uh, ahead of the next meeting, which is on the 31st. And we will, um, discuss it at that time. Tell me, uh, can I give you a, a brief uh, update of what my concern is? I'd rather wait to Yeah, we need to wait. We need to wait. Time. Right. In the interest of time, and also it's not an agenda item. I mean, the, if this, this would have been handled in the public po comment period. There was opportunity to do it at that time, but I, I don't believe you were on at that time. It, that comes at the beginning of the meeting. Well, will this be on the agenda? Um, we can put it on the agenda for the May meeting. Okay, and the date for that, uh, please? It's May 31st. May 31st. Mm -hmm. May 31 is actually Memorial okay. Day. If oh, is it? Okay, so then it will be the 24th. It will be the 24th then, yes. 24th. Thank you, Harvey. Okay, okay, I, I appreciate that. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, and we won't do a roll call vote, but all in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. All right, good night, everybody. Thank right. you. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, thank you.